Well, good morning. good morning. There is some room in the front row if you're, if you're struggling for room. We got people in the lobby today. It's good to have you guys here this morning, and we're glad you're with us today. Uh, folks watching online had about 70 last night, and uh, that's pastorally speaking, which means 65. But uh, <laughs> they said we, they told me they didn't count everybody, to which a pastor means add 10. No, I'm just kidding. We just make stuff up. Cats walk by, we're like, that's six. <laughs> anyway, but we're glad you're here this morning. So David, Psalms 23, David knew what it was like to walk in the valley. If you've been following along with our sermons, we've been in 1 Samuel. And what we're talking about is kind of the, the growth of David and how God knows the heart. And um, the truth about what happened, so a few weeks ago we talked about David being anointed, uh, his dad didn't even bring him in from the field. I mean, that's how much his dad thought about him, which is, you know, middle children, you totally understand. Um, youngest children, you don't, although David was there. But um, anyway, so they bring David in, he anoints him and says, you're going to be king one day, and then uh, back to the field and practice your harp and, and um, slingshot lessons, you know, whatever. And uh, then we, we see David and Goliath. And then uh, last week we talked about how when David... Uh, came back into town, and Saul was with him, and Saul's the king. Now, remember, Saul is head and shoulders above everybody else, and David uh, uh, looks like the pop singer um, Ed Sheeran. And so, um, it's true, he probably did. But anyway, and so uh, David and, and Saul are coming back in town. Saul's probably on some big chariot, and David's just walking, and the women are singing a song, and they, they sing... Uh, Saul has, sl has slain his thousands, and Saul has to be like, yes, I sure have. <laughs> How's it going, right? And, and then they sing, and David his ten thousands, and Saul's like, oh no, that little boy. And so um, Saul from that day on is jealous of David, doesn't trust David. Uh, uh, last, year, last week we talked a little bit about how David had a spear thrown at him, the first time twice, which by the way, if anybody ever tries to kill you, they should not be able to do it twice. Like one time, and then you're out of there. That's my, my advice to you, okay? So today we're going to talk about when you lose your way, and we're going to talk about a heart condition, a, a situation that happens that we all deal with. Now, years ago, I went whitewater rafting. How many of you have ever been whitewater rafting? So one of my favorite activities is whitewater rafting. So if you want to know where to go on the East Coast, let me know. I don't know if I'm ever going to go whitewater rafting in Colorado after hearing my sister's story about falling out of a raft and getting stuck on the bottom. No thanks. But anyway, so, uh, so we went whitewater rafting. We were going down the Ocoee. As we started down the Ocoee, we bumped into another raft. That raft guide had anger issues. He reached over and pulled the plug off of our raft as our raft guide swung over my head, his paddle, to try to whack the guy and started saying words. I grew up in a home with construction, and so I learned a few words early on. I want you to know that day I heard combinations of words that enlightened me to the ability to combine profanity in a, in a way that was never combined. And of course, I'm the leader, the college leader of this church group, and I'm thinking, well, they're getting their full education today. <laughs> so in the meantime, the raft is still leaking air. The guy goes to the front of the raft while we're on rapids, by the way. So the boat is just spinning down the rapids, and he goes and he puts the cap back on. But from that point on, we were in lowrider raft, And we didn't even have good music. And so, so we're going down the river, and the guy said, let's catch him. And th that was the funniest, because I had a college student sitting next to me, and he would say, row, and we'd go. 
rope, because we didn't want him to catch him. We would want him to stay alive, stay alive. And so what happened is, as we went down the river, we all of a sudden hit a rock that nobody else hit because we were in the lowrider raft. And when we hit that rock, I was in the middle of the raft, and we did what I like to call reverse taco. The raft, both the front and the back, went down into the water, and I was now six feet above the water. And the people in the front and in the back, the water was just rushing over, and they're trying to hang on. I grabbed one of the people in the front to hold them in there. And the guy said, I need you all to get out. To which I said, I'm fine right here. But we had to climb out on the rock. Another raft had to come up river to us. And in that raft, there was a guy with a lifeline like this. And the purpose of the lifeline is if somebody falls out of the raft, they throw you. They have it in a little bag, by the way. They throw you this lifeline and you grab it. So it enables you to be pulled in even against the current. Now, thankfully, nobody got washed out, but we had to get off on the rock, reset our thing, and then we had the most boring rafting trip ever until I got a phone call from a judge who worked with the Tennessee uh, uh, Water Authority who actually took away that guy's license for whitewater rafting. Probably a good idea when you try to kill people on the river, you probably should lose your license. Hopefully that guy's not watching today. <clears throat> now, we've all come to a place in our lives where we go through discouraging times. And we've all had a place in our life where we didn't know if we could go forward. We were dealing with maybe discouragement or despair. Maybe we were going through a time of transition, whether it was whether we had a new child in the house or whether our kids were growing up and going off to college or whether a doctor said, I need to see you as soon as possible whether we got fired from a job or we thought it was going to come soon or we were dealing with stress from a family member or something else, we've all been to those points in life where we feel like we're going to go under, we're going to get washed out, we're going to struggle. And so today I want to look at three things that you need to know when you're going through that time of transition, when you're going through that time that you feel lost. That time in life where things aren't settled and it feels like the current is rushing by you and you're afraid you're just going to get washed away. We're going to look today at a story that's thousands of years old. And yet the application today, just like Rodney talked about, is so applicable to what we all deal with in those times of discouragement when things don't go as planned. See, David thought, I'm sure, when he was anointed as king, he thought, well, this is it. Moving on up to the east side to a deluxe apartment in the sky. If you know that song, you're old. <laughs> Just like if you knew Papa Matic. See, yeah. Even when you feel lost, I want to encourage you to keep going forward. We're going to talk about that today. But I want you to know, let, let me say one simple word, one simple sentence I want you to remember it's not a great sentence to say, but you can say it during those times. The struggle makes you stronger. So when you're going through something that you don't like and dealing with somebody, that's, a, that's the uh, sandpaper in your life, <clears throat> uh, maybe boiling acid, you know. When you're at that time of life, it may be the struggle makes you stronger. So, but don't tell your spouse that. If they're going through a hard time, don't start with, hey, just so you know, the struggle makes you stronger. That's when they hit you with something, and then they say, feeling stronger now? <laughs> so when you feel lost, number one, mourn, but keep going forward. I want you to know that despair is common in humans. You are not alone. And it's okay to mourn. It's okay to mourn people when you lose people. It's okay. People come to me all the time and they say, Eric, I'm, I'm dealing with this situation. Somebody came to me the other night at the talent show and was telling me a story. And they said, I'm just really upset about this. And this is the first thing I said to them. You should be upset. And sometimes you have to recognize that it's okay to be upset. And here's the thing about mourning. Sometimes people will say, I can't stop crying. And I say, that's okay. 
And then other people say, I never cry. I, it, I, don't, I haven't cried any. I say, that's okay. You mourn how you mourn whatever it is. This week, somebody told me they lost their pet. And they were just heartbroken about it. Sometimes we're more heartbroken about, 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 about that stuff than losing our jobs. It's amazing, isn't it? And guess jobs. what? It's amazing, okay. isn't it? And it's okay what? to mourn, and it's, it's okay. okay to understand okay to that mourn, certain okay. things in life have to end. And that's what David's dealing with here. See, he's trying to stay in the castle with the king. He's trying to stay there, but he keeps throwing spears at him. So he's starting to figure out, I don't think he likes me. And Jonathan's like, no, he's fine. So then, basically, David does a test where he stays away from the king and Jonathan is there, and finally the king freaks out enough and yells at Jonathan, who should be the next in line, by the way, and basically tells Jonathan he's worthless. Such a nice thing to hear from your parents, isn't it? Some of you have heard that. And then here's what happens next. So Jonathan figures out that his dad really does want to kill David. So we pick up in 1 Samuel 20, verse 41. They were firing some arrows, and the hint to David is, go farther, go farther. And the kid's like, it's right there. And he's like, go farther. So finally, that little boy goes away, and he says, after the boy is gone, David got up from the south side of the stone and bowed down before Jonathan three times with his face to the ground. Then they kissed each other and wept together. By the way, if you have not been around Italians, you have no idea what this means. Tom later will illustrate to each of you. <laughs> last night I told Tom, I said, I said, I told everybody last night in church, I said, I'm used to being kissed. I said, Tom kisses me on the cheek all the time. To which Tom said, no, I don't. Yes, you do. <laughs> and so this was normal, especially in the Middle East and different places in the world. Very normal. I know for Americans, we're like, stay away from each other and uh, in different countries, there's more space. If you go to Taiwan, you don't even get close to people. You just, you just bow at them like, I'm not getting close to you. You look good. But if you're in Italy, man, they're going to hug you and kiss you. And so this is what happens here. And so it says they kissed each other and wept together. And then it says, but David wept the most. Now, time out. I want to give some of the men a little insight here. Some of you have been told it's not okay to cry. To the point that when you cry in front of me, as your pastor, you say, I'm sorry, right away, every time, every time. You cry and you go, I'm sorry, and I want to say to you, why? It's okay. Listen, David, man's man, took out a giant with a slingshot and a rock. If he's okay to cry and play the harp, by the way. then it's okay for you. And so don't let anybody tell you that it's not okay. Just feel how you feel. By the way, our feelings are not always right. Did you know that? How we feel is not always correct. What you think somebody is thinking is not always correct. I had somebody tell me a few weeks ago, you hate me, don't you? <laughs> to which I went, well, why would I hate you? I was trying to figure out, why would I hate you? Why would you think that? Because you haven't talked to me lately. Uh, okay, call me. I, I don't know. By the way, if you don't have my cell phone number, if you join our church, you get my cell phone number right away. If you group text me, I no longer hear your messages. All right. <laughs> Did I say that out loud? I said that out loud. That was the quiet part. Jonathan said to David, go in peace. Why? For we have a sworn friendship with each other in the name of the Lord, saying the Lord witness between you and me, between your descendants and my descendants forever. By the way, later you find out that David... After Jonathan dies, David takes care of Jonathan's son the rest of his life because of this. Then David left and Jonathan went back to the town. Now theologians discuss whether or not Jonathan should have gone with David. Jonathan ended up dying because of his dad. He ended up being killed in battle. And yet David knew, I've got to go forward. I can't stay where I was at. But can I tell you something about going forward? It's horribly uncomfortable. It's horribly uncomfortable. How many of you have ever lost a job? How many of you have ever lost a or job? Or quit a job. Let me just put it there. Okay? Or That's never a feeling of, this is great. Maybe when you quit. For those few minutes, right? 
And then you had the reality of, I've got to do something else. Oh, no. And anytime you first start a job, the most difficult time usually is when you first start, trying to figure out where things are. Their dumb printer never works. Ever. Copy machines are evil. you got to learn. Okay, cross your eyes, point your fingers, and say nice things to the copy machine, right? you got to learn all that stuff, and it's a difficult time. And any time you have a time of transition, whether you did it on purpose or whether, like David, somebody forced your hand, maybe a spouse left. Maybe you dealt with a death. Maybe somebody in your life committed suicide, and all of a sudden you were left to pick up the pieces. Whatever it is, we go through those times where we don't know what to do. And it's okay to grieve the past. It's okay to cry about what just happened. It's okay to hurt for what just happened. You ready for this? It's okay even to be angry about what just happened. But you can't stay there. You can't get stuck. You've got to move forward. And men, I just want to remind you again, when you deal with something emotional and you have a tear come out of your eye, if you feel like you have to apologize, you've got work to do. Listen to what Isaiah 43 says. I read it earlier to the kids. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. By the way, this word for dwell is not just thinking about the past. It's trying to figure out. You ever do the replay game? Will you replay something dumb you did in the past and you think you're going to fix it? Two weeks ago, I walked up to somebody and said the dumbest thing I think I've ever said, which is a pretty high standard, by the way. And I immediately realized what I said to the wrong person, and I went, oh, no. And there was no, and I have replayed that 45 times. Oh, Eric. I mean, I actually out loud a couple of times have gone, oh, Brookins. You ever go back and replay something that happened to you? No matter how many times you think about it, can I tell you something? It goes the same way every time. Every time you replay it, there's no change in the replay. Isn't that amazing how that works? So that's what this verse is talking about. It's okay to think about the past. It's okay to learn from your past. It's okay to to try to look back. But don't try to figure it all out because sometimes you just go... Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. And this word for springs is the word for sprouting in Hebrew. It's the idea of a, of a new plant, a brand new thing. Do you not perceive it? And then he says this, I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You have to understand in Isaiah 43, the Israelites have been taken captive they're, they're, they're in captivity. They're dealing with the worst thing in their life. When they look, they're in the middle of a desert. When they look around, they've gone from being in lush fields to literally being in a desert wasteland. And Isaiah says, don't get stuck there. God is doing something new. No matter what's happening in your life right now, I want to encourage you to keep going forward. It's okay to mourn about what's happening. It's okay to mourn about what happened. I mean, when you wake up some days and you realize your back hurts so much that you wish that when you were younger, you had noticed how good you felt when you woke up in the morning. It's okay to mourn and go, well, guess I'm not playing pickleball anymore. By the way, number one injuries in the country Pickleball, congratulations. You guys have started a new trend. And so it's okay to mourn what you could do, could, can't do anymore. It's okay to mourn those people who've left you one way or the other. But don't stop there. Say, God, I know you want to do good things. I know you want to do new things. This is a new season. It's a new place in my life. Lord, you can bring streams out of deserts. So, Lord, would you show me what's next? You can't stay in that misery. Number two, how do you keep going forward? Find strength in God and friends. Every once in a while, somebody will say to me, all I need is Jesus. And I can hear my mentor, Dave Daniel, saying, that's not true. He said, nowhere in the Bible does it say you only need Jesus. Because God also provides people for your journey. 
Did you know nowhere in the Bible does it say God will not give you more than you can handle? People made that up. Sometimes when people say, God won't give you more than you can handle, I say, well, he did. Well, that's not fair. How am I going to use that quote on somebody to make them feel better? What they need is you. If you're able to say to somebody, God won't give you anything you can't handle, then you're close enough to say to them, hey, you don't have to handle that alone. Exactly. <laughs> Even at and will call you and tell you about it. You ever feel like a failure? You ever despair? I hope you have a friend you can text. A while back, I texted one of my friends. And I said, I I'm just so discouraged. And I just wanted to let you know that I'm discouraged. And I'm going to read you what he texted me back. He said, don't quit. That's always a good start for pastors on Monday, by the way. <laughs> Monday comes along and most pastors are like, I'm done. I actually know of a pastor who left his church on a Sunday morning, went home, wrote a letter to his leaders and said, I quit. You got to at least wait till Tuesday. All right. So he said, don't quit. After the dust settles, you need a break. And to remember why you started doing this. I'm praying for God to encourage you. If you have a friend when you're discouraged, you can just text and say, I just want you to know I'm discouraged. I just want you to know what I'm dealing with. Do you have a friend you can take to lunch? Do you have somebody in your life? If not, you've got to get closer to some people. That's why God created small groups, groups of people to get around, to encourage you. That's why we have church. It's not just to look at the back of somebody's head, although there's some pretty back of heads in here. For Samuel 23, verse 14, a few chapters later. By the way, you could read these chapters. You'll get a whole lot more out of the stories. David stayed in the wilderness strongholds and in the hills of the desert of Ziph. Day after day, Saul searched for him, but God did not give David into his hands. While David was at Horesh in the desert of Ziph, he learned Saul had come to take his life. And Saul's son, Jonathan, went to David at Horesh and helped him find strength in God. Time out. Did you notice Saul couldn't find him, but Jonathan could? Isn't that amazing? I wonder if Jonathan like stood out there like, Hey, David, where are you? I wonder if Jonathan sounded like his dad. Announcement boy. So Jonathan says to him, don't be afraid. By the way, don't be afraid is the same thing as saying have courage. One of the reasons we despair is because we lose our courage our will to go forward, our ability to fight, our recognition that God is with us. We are not alone. He gave you more than you could handle, but you don't have to handle it by yourself. That's why He's with you. And that's why He provides people that just can come alongside and say, have courage. He said, my father Saul will not lay a hand on you. And then listen to what he says next. You realize Jonathan's next in line for the throne. But he says to David, you will be king over Israel and I'll be second to you. Which, by the way, that part never happened. Even my father Saul knows this. The two of them made a covenant before the Lord and Jonathan went home. But David remained at Horesh. David still in the desert. You may be at a desert time in your life. And you may just need somebody who can say, just hang in there. We're here for you. We're going to pray for you. We're here to encourage you. Sometimes people can't take your burden from you, but they can help to lift it. They can let you know that they care. They can let you know that they're praying for you. I honestly believe that when you pray for somebody, that God can help lift their burdens. Why do I believe that? Because the Bible says it. Carry one another's burdens is one of the verses. Now, in your notes, I put the wrong verse in here, so you'll have to forgive me, but he made the right verse, so you'll have to write it in your notes. So I got Randy to put the right verse in. 1 Thessalonians 5.11. Therefore, encourage one another and build or lift each other up, just as in fact you're doing. Is there anybody you've encouraged lately? Do you know anybody going through a hard time? Can I encourage you? Send them a text. You could actually call them. There's an app on your phone with this little thing that looks weird. It looks like a banana almost. I know you've never seen one, but you can push that button. And if you hold it to your ear, 
somebody on the other side will say hello, and it'll be whoever's name you just clicked on. I know you guys have all used a phone, but they don't know what that is. By the way, you realize they don't know why we say hang up. I had a kid ask me, why do we say hang up? I'm like, Pop-O-Matic, pop matic <laughs> Mourn, but keep going forward. Find strength in God and friends. Number three, obey God and don't take shortcuts. Can I tell you my number one advice to people when they're going through a hard time? They come to me and say, my marriage isn't working. They come to me and say, I'm struggling in my job. They come to me and they say, this is what's going on. And here's what I say every time. Don't get in a hurry. More mistakes are made when people are in a hurry than any other time. That's the reason that it says, cut twice and measure once, right? No, it says, right? Measure, thanks for catching that. Measure twice, cut once. You can't undo it once you cut it. So take your time and do it right. There's a place in my house that drives me crazy. It is literally this big. And what happened is, when we took the old floor out, there was about an inch of concrete under the old floor that I had to chip out and then get a diamond blade and buff it out. And I went into this one place in the kitchen and I said, oh, that's where the island is. I'm just going to rush through this part. So we laid the floor down with that little bump in it. We put the island in and I went, oh, no. There's one place. Right where you open the fridge and just step back. You know how you have to take that half step back? That left foot lands right on that spot every time. And yells at me, that's what you get for hurrying. Five minutes. If I could go back in time. No, Eric, take that out. You're going to think of that every day. I can see it when I look. Oh, no. From getting in a hurry. Too often, the reason that you get in trouble is because you try to take a shortcut. The reason young couples get in trouble is because they try to take a shortcut, hurry up a relationship. You get in a hurry at work because you're mad about something that happened and you throw everything down and say, I quit. And then you go, oh no. Quit getting in a hurry. Quit trying to take a shortcut. Most sin is a shortcut. Listen to what happens here. He came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there and Saul went to relieve himself. It actually literally in the Hebrew says he went to cover his feet. You can think about that. David and his men were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of. When he said to you, I'll give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. So the men were like, this is the time. Kill him. So David crept up unnoticed, cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Afterwards, David was conscious stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He said to his men, the Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lay my hand on him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. This was David's chance to be king right away. And he knew he should wait. Whatever you're dealing with today where you're discouraged and you're in despair, can I tell you one of the main rules you can do is wait. There'll come a time that you need to take action. There's things that you need to do. It doesn't mean wait and take a nap. But it means wait and pray and seek God and get advice from your friends and say, what do you think I should do? How do you think I should do this? And make sure they're godly friends because ungodly friends will give you the wrong advice. Acts eleven twenty two talks about what this looks like in the New Testament. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem. They sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God had done, he was glad. And he encouraged them to remain true to the Lord with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And great number of people were brought to the Lord. What did Barnabas do? Barnabas literally means son of encouragement. He was a person who said, just keep doing what God wants you to do. Do you have somebody in your life that can say, keep doing what God wants you to do? Do you have somebody in your life that you're coming alongside and saying, keep doing what God wants you to do? Don't give up. Have courage. If you're in a time of transition, a time of despair, a time of discouragement, I want you to know you're not the only one. And there's other people that God will bring along your path. 
If right now you're not going through a time of discouragement, can I tell you that you need to be there for somebody else? And by the way, even when you're going through a time of discouragement, one of the best ways to be encouraged is to encourage somebody else. I don't know what you're going through today, but I know that God has put people in your life and His Spirit and His strength to give you a lifeline. And if you need that, listen, if you don't have anybody else, you can, my, my number's on the back of the bulletin, my email's there, you can send me an email and say, Pastor Eric, I'm just discouraged, would you just pray for me? Maybe after the service, you just want some prayer, so you're welcome to come up, I'd be glad to pray for you. You can also grab somebody next to you and say, would you just pray for me before we leave? The prayer of a righteous person makes a big difference. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that after the service. I'll be here and you can say, I know that Jesus died for me and rose again. And when I surrender my life to him, that's how you find strength in his spirit. A lot of people know about Jesus, but it's when you surrender your life to him. When you say, Jesus, I want to follow you the rest of my life. I confess that I'm a sinner. I'm messed up. I'm broken. Would you forgive my sins? And when you surrender your life to him, that's how you take that next step of faith and walk with him. If you want to do that today, I'd love to talk to you about more about what that means to surrender your life to him today. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your love for us, Lord. I want to pray for all of those here who are dealing with discouragement. Some who are in a deep valley right now. Lord, would you right now let them know that they are loved? Father, would you through your spirit give them your strength? Lord, thank you that we don't have to do life alone. I pray that you would surround those with friends who need it especially, but Lord, also make us sensitive to others. We thank you for your encouragement. In Jesus' name, amen.